Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. If you found it, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Are you with me? Jesus said, come apart and rest and eat before you come apart. And they departed into a desert place by a ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew and ran a foot thither out of all cities and outwent them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he had come out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Behold, they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they... And, and they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. When they had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up into heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they did eat all of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that we sense here tonight. Minister and move in this place and help us now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you as you're seated. I don't really have a title as of say for tonight, I was just reading in the book of Mark chapter 6 and noticed some things here in my heart getting ready for. We just had camp. We've got kids crusade that we are partaking of this week in Vernon. And we have kids crusade. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll start kids crusade through Friday. And our desire is to reach the children of our city. Our desire is to reach people. Our desire is to see souls saved for the kingdom. I have never seen such a day where people are as busy as they are right now. We've got more technology than we've ever had before to do things for us. I mean, you don't even have to shop at Walmart now. It's a fact. All you have to do is look on there, click on what you want, pull up, and they will bring what you clicked, bring it out and put it in your car. It's a trick. Because they do not always put in there what you want, and so they put something else, and then you get hooked on the other orange juice. And so now not only do you buy the kind that you like, but you have to buy your wife's kind, so now you're buying two kinds. It's a trick. 
Notice the plan of the master. Jesus has ministered all day long. He's with his disciples. They are hungry, they are weary, and they are tired. And all they are looking for is a quiet spot on the, on the far side of Galilee. Now, for many of us that have had the privilege of being there, you know you can see all the way across to the other side. And at this point, the writers believe they was just going about four miles across. They was going from one side, they was leaving where they was at, they was going. But the winds can make that four-mile journey a long journey. Jesus said, get in the boat, we're going to go to the other side, we're going to a private place, we're going to get away before we come apart, we're going to come apart and go over there and rest and eat. They start going, but the crowd sees them, and so this crowd starts to move around, and the crowd travels about eight miles. While they travel four miles in a boat fighting against the winds, <laughs> the crowd travels eight miles and they're gaining momentum. And when they pull up to this quiet spot, here's 20,000 people. Surprise. The crowd is watching and they run around and obviously they arrive before the boat. Can you imagine the disciples as they start working their way in? They're 15 to 20 miles from any other city. They think we're going to pull up in this little, we're just going to sit down here and eat a sandwich and we're going to get a little rest and we're, we've been working all day. This is what we're doing. And about the time they start to see the shoreline, it's crawling and it's not with ants. There's people and they're everywhere and they're hollering, here he comes, here comes Jesus. As they're coming into the bank, they think they're headed for a quiet retreat, but they see this crowd. The natural aspect of any man, human, would be, I've done done everything I can do. Get away from me. I'm tired. Can I go ahead and talk to you first of all? God knows how to stretch you and move you beyond your comfort zone. Somebody told me this past week, and I'll tell you who it was. It was my mother. This is Wednesday night. Brother Garland said, why don't you preach like you do on Sunday, like you do on Wednesday night? You preach better on Wednesday night than any other time. Thank you, Brother Garland. I appreciate that, and I was listening. Wednesday night, I'm able to share, and I'm able, I'm able to be a little more honest and get down to the nitty-gritty. My mother told me last week, what are you doing? You're about to kill yourself. You're not acting very wise. You get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, you catch, you, or actually it was 3.30 in the morning, you fly or you drive over through Los Angeles, catch an airplane, fly in, you lose two hours, you land, the Brad and Dacia pick you up, take you home, you shower, change, get in a car with the Kirklands, drive to Vernon, preach their five-year anniversary, go out to eat with them and sit down with their family, call the family around and the pe people around and you pray for them and get home about one o'clock in the morning. Don't you know you don't have to preach every night? It would be all right if you just stayed home every once in a while. I almost felt like the spirit of Sister Sanders was in the building. Sister Sanders would tell me, you're not supposed to go preach everywhere else. You're supposed to stay right here and preach. Thank you, Sister Mary. <laughs> but Jesus is on one side, and he goes over to the other side, and he's flat wore out, and he shows up. Let me tell you, God wants to use you while we have the opportunity. Now, I'm all about being wise. I'm all about, I, I understand that we must rest. But all of a sudden, in the providence of God, a story, a happening, an event that is recorded in all four Gospels takes place at their most stressed, tired time in their life. No doubt, you cannot tell me that Peter wasn't saying, these crazy people, that's, that, that's Jim Bob. I saw him on the other side. He ran all the way back around here. Kidding, hadn't he had enough of church already? I am, fly, I, am not, I am not doing that anymore. I am not putting up with these people anymore. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to deal with them. I've had enough. Our feelings can get in the way and we can miss an opportunity. We can be in the middle of Walmart and our feelings will get in the way. Woo! We can be driving down the road and somebody cut us off and our feelings, oh, oh, we can be going,
going home and our feelings of tiredness will cut off a victory in our own family. Oh, I didn't figure anybody. Sit down. Don't run the aisles right there. They're coming into the bank and the Savior looked at them and the Bible said that he loved them. He was tired. He was wore out. But he looked at them and when he saw them, he loved them. The other day I was leaving from the parsonage next door. There's three boys that live there that I'm really attached to. I love them and I, I, the older they get, the more I love them, the more I'm around them, the more I like to be around them. But I understand that if I go over there that they don't understand the time frame. Judas already got to where he says, just five more minutes. Just five more minutes. I, just, just five more minutes. So I, I go over there and I get out in the floor and I'm playing with them. And I get up and I say, I got to go. And they don't go, Papa. Don't go. There's nothing like going to the door and trying to slip out, put on your shoes, point across the room at something, and then step out and slam the door and hear them crying. And you turn around and you look at the door and all three of them stand there beating on the door. I went to the fence, I closed the fence, and I start jumping up over the fence. They see me, they're laughing. I stood there for about five minutes jumping. I thought, this is stupid. I'm flat wearing myself up. I might as well open the gate and go back in there and lay down in the floor and play with He didn't want to leave them. Jesus saw these and they was hungry and he did not want to leave them. Why? Because he loved them. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. They was lonely. They was hungry. They was lost. And so he began to teach them many things. Listen, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the people around you today that you're rubbing shoulders with on the job or at the grocery store, they're lost, they're lonely, they're hungry. They need the Savior. And he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. There's three things about sheep. Sheep are, number one, sheep are more prone to wander than any other animals. Cows will understand at the end of the day, if I'm going to be milked, I need to go back to the barn. A horse knows if he wants to be fed, he's got to go back to the feed. He's got to go. Cats, they'll run around, but they know. They, dogs, they can run around. They know if they go, they need to cut pigs even. Deer are deer of routine. Once they're fed, they'll know how to get back to where they was fed. But sheep are wandering animals. They most resemble humans. Why? Because something will catch their eye and off they go and they take off and they lose their way and they can't remember how to get back. We are more like sheep than any other animal. Jesus said they're like sheep without a shepherd. Number two, sheep always need to be led. In the Middle East where you find sheep, you'll never find them alone because a shepherd will be there. He must lead them to fresh pasture. They tell me that horses can smell water, and when they're thirsty, they'll begin to move toward where that water is. They will go to it, but sheep will die in the wilderness when there's green pasture right around the corner. That's why Jesus said he taught them many things, because they needed the bread of life. He was willing to postpone his rest because he needed to meet the need of the hungry multitude. Sheep constantly need to be protected. There's no natural defense given to sheep. Try to catch a wild horse. You get up close enough, you hem him in, he's going to knock you out with his hind legs. Try to catch a deer. They'll cut you with their hooves, or if it's a buck, I've had them charge me, literally, a buck that was guarding a fawn. Charged me a big eight point, threw his horns down on the ground in the wild open. But sheep have no natural defense. They are among the most helpless of all creatures. The Lord surely saw this when he said, they are like sheep without a shepherd. They need a shepherd to protect. They need a shepherd to feed. They need a shepherd to comfort. And Hebrews said he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Verses 35 through 37 tells us they'd come to a desert place. The Greek word is eremos, which means isolated, lonely, desolate, or uninhabited. Maybe you're in that place tonight. I'm preaching to you on a Wednesday night. Isolated, lonely, desolate, 
uninhabited. They are 15 to 20 miles from any city or community. It is evening time. They cannot go and obtain food. The shops are already closed. There's 5,000 men, and they are hungry. There is a potential for a mob. They are hungry. They are frustrated. And Jesus said, feed them. Jesus said, I want you to go into where you're at, and I want you to feed them. I want you to go into your lost family. I want you to go into your community, and I want you to feed them. Lord, how can we do that? Lord, what are you talking about? There's no way we can feed them. God said, I want you to take what I have given to you, and I want you to give them bread. What does the disciple say? 200 penny worth of bread would be insufficient. Where would they going to find it? Where would they buy it even if we had the money? Now listen to me. Look at Matthew chapter 20. Do you remember Matthew chapter 20? Jesus tells a story about a man who has a vineyard. He calls people to work and he says, I'm going to give you how much for one day's work? A penny. You're the lucky. Praise the Lord, Sister Sprayberry. A penny. A whole penny for a day's work. And they signed up for it. And what does Jesus tell in that parable? It's getting toward the end of the day and he calls out these boys and says, come on, I'll pay you a penny. And they said, hold on, that's not fair. Because you're paying us a penny and we're working all day and he's come on and he's only going to work two hours and you're going to pay him a penny. And he said, what's it to you? You agreed to work. It was a fair wage to work all day for a penny. If I want to give to him a penny and he only works two hours and I give this man a penny and it's a fair wage and he works eight hours, what's it to you? I'm the master. I can give out what I want to. Because a penny was a one day's wage. So the disciples said if we had 200 penny worth, now they was not able to work on the Sabbath. So that's talk. We are talking about nine months. They're saying if a man worked for nine months, we wouldn't have enough wages to feed this multitude. If we took a man's wages for nine months, if we took all 12 of us, we'd have to work over three weeks to get enough to just get started. And that still wouldn't be enough to feed this multitude. Are you still with me? The disciples had an answer. Their disciples, their, their reasoning was looking at it through the eyes of the disciples. Lord, how can you save them? Can I go ahead and preach to you? They, don't you know where my children are? Don't you know what they told me last week? Don't you know how bad it is? Don't you know how deep I'm in debt? Don't you know what they said? Don't you know how low? And we'll tell all the impossible reasons when the Lord tells us to do something as to why it can't happen. Oh, I like this. I hope this will get a hold of you here in a minute. All four Gospels record this event. Matthew 14 tells us that there was a great number of women and children. So if there's 5,000 men and there's a woman there for every man, that's 10,000. If they have two children, that's 20,000. But Matthew says there was a great number. There could have been 25,000. When we're sitting down there and we're looking over that place where the great multitude and Jesus is down by the water, there they are. And Jesus saw them. This is what I've been trying to get to right here. And he said, give them something to eat. Feed them. Why would we have kids crusade? Why would you go over there Drive over there to Brother Dykeman's. Why would you pay 
send kids over there, buy a motel, put them over there. Why would you do that? Why would you take, why would you pay for kids to go to camp? I had somebody tell me one time, we got enough snotty and old running kids running around here. If one of them runs into me, you know what I did? I went, I just started biting my tongue. I like it does me good seeing Tristan in the house of the Lord. Y'all ain't helping me in here. Ain't nobody. Next week, should the Lord tarry, I want to see this whole section over here full of boys and this whole section over here full of girls. Kids. Excuse me. Kids are goats. Children. Children. Jesus loves the children. Any child, we want to go get them. Why? Because we do not know the potential. Can you imagine while they're running that eight-mile trip, getting over there, they know Jesus is going to a private place, a public, no, no, he's trying to get secluded. They come all the way around, and they start spreading the news, hey, Jesus, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, he's coming around here. And all of a sudden, this little boy says, I'm going. And here, an unnamed lad shows up with the potential to feed 20,000. There was days when Michael Brandon sat down in my office and cried and told me how mean I was and told me how nobody liked him and told me how that I was just being prejudiced and I didn't understand what it was like. There was one day in particular where the spirit of Sister Snow rose up and she talked to him like she has talked to me a couple of times. <laughs> he started telling her how bad it was. She sat him down, told him how good he had it. She started going down the list and she was raising her voice and telling him. And when she got through, he was crying and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's been talking to her this past week when a boy that he has ministered to fell out away from the Lord, came back to the Lord last week at camp. In the middle of revival while we was in California, he was texting Sister Snow, telling her things that God was doing. He was calling me, talking to me Sunday on Father's Day. What, what, what the potential that's wrapped up in one boy. Who knows? Who knows what all God will do? Jerry, the potential that is wrapped up in one individual that'll take everything they have and give it to the Lord. My goodness, I feel the preacher here on a Wednesday night. Jada, you have so much to give. Maddie, you have so much to give, Tanner. You have so much to give, Ethan. Josh, God has spared your life. Enemy has fought against the James gang. All to both of you and your other brother. The enemy has done everything he can to come against us, Brother Oliver. But when we take what we have, 
No doubt that little boy, while he was on his way, somebody saying, stand back, little boy. I got to get up here. I, you, you're not going to cut in front of me. I, I'm going to see what Jesus is doing here. Praise the Lord. And little did they know, by letting him in, they was letting in the potential to give them the nourishment and the strength that they are going to need to get home that night. You never know. Don't you tell me about so-and-so coming in here and sitting down. They stink. They look bad. They're dirty. You don't know the potential that is in them when they take what they have and they give it to the master at what God can do in their heart and in their life. Here they come. And here's the little boy. An, uh, 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 unnamed. We don't know his name. Notice, Jesus said, I want them to be seated. Why did he want them to sit down? Because number one, God is a God of order. He said, I want you to sit down. By them sitting down, they are getting ready for what God is going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They are getting in order, 50s and 100s. They're setting in sections, and he's getting them all lined up, and he's getting them ready for what God is going to do. I believe it's time that the church began to prepare and to get ready and to get seated and get in order for what God is going to do. And another reason he wanted them to sit down is he wanted them to be able to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seeing is believing. Jesus is going to stand up and he's what needs to be seen. Everybody else needs to sit down. If we can get the Lord elevated and lifted up where everybody can see him, hallelujah, it'll make all the difference in the world. Be seated. I believe a third reason goes in there. I wrote it down. Safety. I believe Jesus was concerned... If all of a sudden everybody's hungry and you start saying, th th it'd be like a fifth Sunday dinner. Oh, help me, Lord. Mm. I, I see my friend Jim Bob up there. I'm going to go talk to him. I mean, orderly. He wanted safety. So he said, be seated. Because I don't want no children to get run over in this process. You imagine 5,000 and somebody say, there's a basket of fish up there. <laughs> there's a picture that we put up last year. And it was, yeah, I think it was last year. It was taken, I don't know, but we was in Zambia. And uh, because I am mucho grande... Did you just say extra, extra, mucho grande? Let me get the oil. We want to pray for Sister Kim right now. Because I'm a big man, they chose me to stand in the door because people was trying to slip into the door at the Kids' Crusade in Zambia to take, get extra candy and get extra balloonies. It blew up balloons. Mothers, mothers with little babies strapped on their back would be lining up. I'm not kidding you. Brother Marshall, I think it was his name. Brother, can't remember his name, was standing there with about a five-foot water hose swinging it. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's trying to keep, because we want to take care of the children that have come and that have sat there and that are on the inside. And people from the outside are pushing their way in. And you can get trampled. You can literally get trampled and the dust and the everything rising. And so they was, they was trying to do it in a fast fashion. Sister Marino's handed me two pieces of something and a balloon. Here, here. And they're going, here. And, and, and the, the locals are, are standing there. Young, I'll never forget it. A young girl standing there. Come, 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 come. Hurry, stop. Hurry, hop! And they're hollering and they're carrying on and I'm, and I'm standing there and I'm trying to, you know, I'm 6'3 and I'm trying to put the balloon. In. 
And all of a sudden, I didn't like it. I didn't. As the one little kid said, I didn't yike it. And I said, stop! And I got down on my knees. When I got down on my knees, I could look into their eyes. And I saw eight-year-olds with a little three-year-old in the middle who was being pushed between two. And his eyes was as big as saucers. Because he's it's like a stampede pushing. And I was able to put a balloon and pat him on the back. Yeah, it might have took an extra 30 minutes, but it was worth it. Because I wanted to say, thank you for coming. And Jesus was concerned about the safety of 5,000. So he said, I want you to sit down and I want you to get in orders of 50. And I want you to get in orders of hundreds. Because we're getting ready for what God's going to do. John is the only one that tells us who provided the lunch. He said, a lad. I've always thought, even up to this week, when they had 12 baskets left over, when we think of baskets, we think of laundry baskets. Oh, don't, don't we? They had 12 baskets. Look here, Louie. Got a whole basket full. I mean, we think of a basket, but that's not what it was. A basket was a small receptacle, a small little piece that was carried by strict Jews. And inside that was enough bread for the journey because they didn't, the strict Jews do not believe in buying lunch or anything from pagans. So they carry on a journey, they carry a little basket, what we would probably call a little fanny pack. They got them a little old basket on their side. And in that basket is enough bread and enough fish for that little boy. Why? Because like we won't produce, we don't want to take, we don't want to go to Target. We don't want, come on. Th and the strict Jews, there's things they will not promote. They will not spend their money to the heathen. And so they pack their lunch when they go on a journey. And so here's this little boy with his little basket, with his little five little pieces of bread and his two small fish in his little pocket, his little basket that is left there for him. Hallelujah. This man who was unnamed, this little boy who's carrying enough just for himself, but Christ, the bread of life, sees the multitude and he comes, brings this little boy and he said, if you give me what you got, hallelujah, I'm ready to do something with it. I don't care how much you got. I don't care how little it is. If you'll take what you have, quit telling me what all you've done, how bad you've been, and what all God cannot do. Bring what you've got and give it to the Master. What Jesus do with it? Turn to your neighbor, it's fixing to get better. Jesus passed it out. No, he did not. Jesus thanked God for it. I believe he took that little basket and he lifted it up and he reached in there with one hand and got the majority of that lunch out and said, thank you, Father, for this bread and loaves. I thank you, Lord, that you've heard me. You know that I'm tired. You know I'm trying to please you. And here's a great multitude that is hungry. And unless they are fed tonight, they're going to go home. I believe in you, God, to intervene and to make a way, perform a miracle to show your glory. And then what does he do? What does he do with it? He gives it to the disciples. What are you going to do with this tonight? Some of you have heard enough good preaching. And I'm not talking about me. Some of you in your life have heard enough good preaching, you could start your own program. Thank you, Brother Bill. You've heard it for years. 
years on end. When? 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 We've been given the bread. We've been given the gospel. Now it is up to us to pass it to somebody else. The Lord, his word is good. It is true. It is powerful. It is fulfilling. It is quickening. It is the delivering source for mankind. It's the sin chaser. Hallelujah. Preach the word. Teach the word. Take the word. Take the bread of life. Give it. Give it. He gave it to his disciples. He took the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And then he commanded them to break it and give it out to supply the needs of their own resources. He say, Andrew, take what you've got and give it out. Y'all ain't hearing me. We don't have anything to give. Oh, y'all, I wish I could get this. I don't want to hear your story. I don't want to hear about how good you are. I want to hear about how good Jesus is. I want to hear what Jesus has done for you. I want to hear what he has given to you. I want you to take what he has given to you, and I want you to give that out. And our own resources, they are way too small. They are inadequate. Unless I obtain food from the hand of Christ, the congregation will go hungry. You know why churches are starving and drying up? Because there's nobody getting a hold of any food from heaven. Listen, it's not my words. It's the words of life. It's not about me. It's about him. But what I receive from the Lord, I must give. And as we give it, we must partake of it and give it out. Provision and cooperation with the followers cannot benefit us Unless we take what is offered. Brother Tim, come and help me. Get me out of this tonight. And somebody said, Pastor, Presbyter, we've got our pastor over here and he has been preaching the same message for six months. Same message. I said, really? Really? What's he been preaching? Well, I really don't know, but it's been the same thing. He preaches the same thing. Well, maybe that's why he's still preaching it. Because you ain't got it yet. Seems like that's all he talks about. That's all he talks about. Maybe when you get a hold of it, he can talk about something else. I don't like fish. Tough. Go hungry. I wanted whole white bread. I didn't want wheat bread. Y'all. You know, the problem is, is you're full of something else. And you're not hungry for what Jesus has to give. Can you imagine... That horseshoe and Jesus down by the river or the, the, the Sea of Galilee as he raises his hands and he starts to pass it out. No doubt somebody about four rows. <laughs> Ain't none of that getting back here, I can tell you right now. But every time they broke it and they passed it, every time they broke it and they passed it, it, it it grew in their hands and and every time they passed it and turned around, did you get some? And they turned around and passed it. Brothers, no, I can't, I can't, I can't afford. No, you can't afford not to. If if you'll take what God has given to you and you'll turn around and pass it to somebody else, God will increase what's in your hand. God will take what's in your hand and multiply it as you turn. Oh, man, I've been, oh, wow, woo, 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 woo. It's wonderful serving the Lord. You won't talk about joy. Start passing it out. Start giving it away. And when you start to give it away, you'll find joy that you never knew of before.
provisions and cooperation will not benefit us unless we take what is offered. Christ supplied what was needed, but He never forces His guests to partake. And if anybody went away hungry that night, it wasn't the Lord's fault because He provided what was needed. All they had to do was partake. When he was tired and exhausted. I I don't know. I'm just going to be honest with you. I I see some folks that are weary. I see some folks that ain't doing like they used to. And something's gotten cold in their soul. That's because you're feeding on something else. And you're not taking what the Lord has given. And you're not taking what's been given to you and giving it away. Notice the miracle took place as they didn't keep it for themselves, but as they passed it to somebody else. We are in such a selfish society. If I hear it once, I got two texts tonight while I sit down. Well, I feel like this is what I see. Father, I pray tonight that you'd give us a hunger for those things which you have. I pray, Lord, that when we're, when we're tired and weary, that we would see folks the way that you see them and we'd bring them to Jesus. There's an unnamed lad out there. And has the potential to feed a multitude. But we must let him in. And those of us that are here tonight, we must give what we have to you so we can be blessed. Minister, move in this altar now in the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me all over this house? If you're willing to take what God has given to you, you're willing to give it to the Lord. You're willing to say, Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to join me in this altar right now. Hallelujah.